I'm about to share my screen. Okay. And there we go. Oh, right. Lovely. So today we're thinking about fundraising through tourism. And I thought we'd kick off with a few just facts and figures uh, that help us put this in a context. 40 million visits to churches per year in this country. 55% of day trips include a visit to a cathedral or a church. Each parish church typically receives around 700 to 4,000 visitors each year. And visitors to churches, according to the Churches Tourism Association, must generate at least 30, 350 million pounds per year for churches. So as you can see, it's quite a large amount of people who, who visit churches every year, which is why we should take tourists seriously. Why are we thinking about this in the context of funding today? Well, firstly, it is actually a requirement from some of our funders, for example, the National Churches Trust. Uh, it's also a potential income stream. And when we're thinking of funding, we need to think about our match funding and raising money to go towards that. Um, and also, thirdly, it is a benefit to, to your community. And also, again, funders want to see how that uh, benefits the community. And Jane will be talking a bit more about that later. National Churches Trust actually say in their guidelines that uh, for them to give you a, a grant, then you need to be open for at least 100 days a year beyond worship, i.e. not on a Sunday, uh, within a year of project completion. And also they ask that you should submit your details to the Explore Churches website, which I'll mention on the next slide. Um, National Lottery Heritage Fund, they are a bit more firm about this, they have a mandatory outcome. A wider range of people will be involved in heritage. Uh, again, Jane's going to, uh, to cover that a little bit later on. So uh, thinking about National Churches Trust, this is a, a, a slide shot of, of their one of their pages, their main page actually, on explorechurches.org, which is run through the tourism uh, um, side of the National Churches Trust. It's a fabulous website. Please do have a look at it if you haven't. And uh, there's, uh, I think we've got about 100 Cornish churches on there at the moment. Uh, that I was involved quite at the beginning when they were first setting this up. So sort of rallying, rallying the troops and getting churches to add their, their church to this website. So you can see there on the map on the right hand side, uh, all those red dots there are churches who are actually featured on the website. It's really easy to, to join it and to put your details in and add some photos. So at the bottom of the main page on explorechurches.org, you'll see add your church there and you click on that and, and, and submit your details. So it's well worth doing, even if you're not doing any funding at the moment or, or applying to National Churches Trust. It's, it's a great way to advertise the beautiful churches that you're from. And the second thing I said was about the income. It is an income. And a few things to think about there. Do you have a contactless donation device in your building? Um, they're not that expensive. This little one down here, this is the type of thing we're talking about. They're only £19 to buy. And the setup with it, yep, you've got to get something to go with it and things like that. But you can do it for under £100 now quite easily. So, uh, and there's more help for that if you are interested in that and that's not already happening in your church, then um, uh, talk to Daniel. He, he knows all about that and we'll be very happy to help you with that. But also secondly, have you got your online giving set up? So that's when people can go to your website and give via your website. Uh, QR codes, well, we're all used to those now when we have to, to uh, check in to cafes and pubs and restaurants and things like that now so we're all used to a QR code and they're fantastic simple things to use and print out to link to all sorts of things but um, certainly even to link to giving so you could even have a poster in your building saying you know about giving click here to link to that 
contactless devices are probably easier for people because they're there in front of them. They just have to flash the card at it. But QR codes are, are the next second best to link to that. Um, OK. Um, also, don't forget to have those little gift aid envelopes to hand as well, because uh, they will give you an extra 25 percent. And people, again, are really happy to fill in their details for gift aid because it's they're used to doing it now when you go anywhere these days, whether it's the zoo, um, they'll, they'll ask, would you be happy to gift aid things? So people are very well used to doing that. One thing to say avoid the request for money being the first thing a visitor sees it's it it's not great really and, it, and it's it, they don't want you don't want people to think that you're just asking for money all the time so to get around that think of some inspiring ways to to make that ask because at the end of the day you do need to ask it's no point being you can be as welcoming and as warm and and interesting as anything but if you don't actually ask for people to to give then they won't uh they might put a little bit of money in the box but but generally you do need to ask these are some examples uh, i took this one we went to one of the national trust uh places in Staunton, which is a fabulous place it's huge a lot of people go there it's along the a30 you might have been there but um in their church they had this appeal which started off saying thieves have stolen all the lead from our 12th century church we're now left with an enormous task of raising 50,000 pounds and it goes on to say um, without your help we will be in a bit of trouble here please could you help we, you know a little bit will help and actually I, I did I put a couple of pounds in I think at that time perhaps a bit more the amount of people they have going into that church because it's next to the National Trust place, they must easily have 50,000 people going through there in a summer, I imagine. So if everybody gave a pound, then they've covered their appeal. So I think they put it quite well. I think that's all right. The Truro Cathedral one says every single year, Truro Cathedral has to raise 1.3 million. And the next line there, if you can see that, how's your eyesight? Um, it says we receive no state funding um, and rely on um, the generous generosity of supporters. They put that in bold because we get a lot of Germans coming to Cornwall and uh, in Germany they are state funded churches. So people might think, oh, I don't need to give because this beautiful cathedral is looked after by the government but as we're not that's why they've spelt that out so that's another way of putting it a lot of people will say how much it costs and i suppose people don't realize how much it does cost to run a church but it, there's some people don't think it's that inspiring some people think it's okay it's it's very subjective really the third one i like here which i saw uh, on the door of st philly friend believer or not believer or not, believer or not, welcome to the beautiful Church of St. Philly. We hope that your visit may result in quiet meditation, perhaps prayer. May this visit stay with you as a moment of peace. I like that. I think that's really warm and friendly. Um, and just is it's the welcome that you need to start with. So as we're thinking, although we're thinking about funding with tourists, please, please first think about how welcome you are to start with, how warm and welcome you are so that people feel um, great when they walk in the door of, of your building, your church. Perhaps a, a kind of warmer way of saying it's perhaps if you've enjoyed this beautiful church, please consider supporting us and keeping this building alive for generations to come. So uh, that's a softer way of asking, but at least it's asking. Now, each church is unique they're amazing buildings aren't they every church is an incredible building over forty thousand in the country over 300 in cornwall and they're all different they all have a unique story to tell a unique experience to offer people and they're just wonderful wonderful places to visit which explains going back to those original stats why people will go into a church because they're all different 
And so why should we be a storyteller when we're thinking about um, communicating to people what our church is about and what's here? What have we got to show people? I like this quote, it's an ancient need to be told stories, but the story needs a good storyteller. I must admit, I do like good stories. And I have to say, I like sermons that have stories in them. That's how I remember things, to be honest. There can be lots of facts and figures and things in a sermon, but unless there's a story there, I'll have forgotten it by coffee time after the service. But um, but actually, I, I think I'm, I'm backed up by facts. The numbers of visitors purely interested in church architecture, architecture are small. People are interested in social history, people and stories. And we know visitors gravitate towards stories that involve people. So just bear that in mind as we're, as we're thinking of this. Two of those photos there, um, one from from St Uni, I think they're both actually they're both from St Uni um, near Red Roof and they did a huge um, interpretation which we'll be talking about in a minute about the fact that that church was a mining church, fantastic stories in there and um, about the different people who were buried in the graveyard as well and when you look at their their visitors book that it, it that's what it it talks about actually the history the stories that are there so bear that in mind stories are really important so what is your story when you're thinking about your church research your church for stories on famous and not so famous people local history religious stories events that happened in the past uh, this plaque here was to do with the, the Mayflower. That's fantastic. It's fascinating. The Mayflower stopped off at New Lynn for water because there'd been cholera outbreaks in, in Plymouth. So, in fact, New Lynn was the last place the Mayflower was before it then headed off overseas. Um, quirky tales and folklore. One that comes to mind is, is Zena, uh, the mermaid of Zena which is a very um, quirky tale that's down to be found down there. And um, I won't go into that one. <laughs> it's a long story. Who is in your who is in your graveyard? Now, this is fascinating. Going back to St Uni, they even had a, um, a play that they put together where they brought to life basically those who were buried in their graveyard. Incredible. The stories that they found of those people who were buried there just as astonishing there was one person who had gone off to um, America to, uh, to do gold mining and his story there was um, another one was a lady who was a suffragette it just just incredible so I'm sure in your graveyard there'll be some very fascinating people stained glass windows and monuments as well of course they often have a story around them, whether it was the person who funded it, but also quite often you'll find uh, interesting elements in those glass windows that have that that aren't related to the to a Bible story, but are related to somebody in that community. So do look out for that. I mentioned interpretation, and that's the word that's always used and bandied around in heritage. Um, types of organizations uh, all heritage sites need interpretation when I first moved here and I was working at the cathedral and the, the education officer was talking about interpretation well at that point I was thinking isn't that when you have to translate something from another language I'd not come across that word interpretation but as soon as you get involved with anything to do with heritage and funding the word interpretation will be there and um, basically it is it's a process, as I put there, the definition, communicating your message and stories about our cultural and natural heritage. So it's factual information, interaction, way to tell stories, excitement, interest. Traditionally, when we think of interpretation, we probably think of leaflets and guidebooks, paddles. I've been to a few churches where they've got those sort of paddles that you have, you can hold and walk around reading about the church. And laminated sheets, um, banners. Here's an example of one from um, Cubit Church. Uh, they, they're lovely, actually, if you have the chance to go to Cubit um, up near, got south of Newquay. That's probably the easiest way to describe where that is. Uh, 
fabulous panels uh, on the history in the church. Some churches will have stewards to talk about the church. Uh, some churches do guided tours and, and special events and activities. Uh, sometimes churches would have talks about their, their uh, stained glass windows or their monuments. Digital interpretation. This is moving on in the sense that we're all used to now. Um, new ways to tell your stories with an interactive content. So if you think about it, most people now, majority of people now have a smartphone and will bring those with them into the church. And as I said earlier about our QR codes linking to ways to give money, they also can link to pages on your website, which might have more information about different parts of your church. So rather than have lots of posters around the place or information or, or a guidebook, people can click on that QR code, which takes them straight to the information already on the website with photos and all sorts of things. Um, and it's something they can look at later as well. Not to say that we shouldn't have guidebooks, it's just this is another way. And that's how I, things are moving forward. In, in interpretation is having a variety, not one way suits everybody. So you have to do, have to think about different ways of, of sharing the story. So what do you already have in your church? When you think about it, what, what is there to help somebody new coming to the church to, to tell them your story? And, um, it is important to examine it quite critically. Sometimes guidebooks can, there's so much you want to say about your church that you end up with a guidebook which has got font 10, which is tiny words um, and very few photographs stuffed in a couple of pages. Well, most people find that difficult to read, both from a, um, an eyesight point of view, but just from a, an engaging and interesting way. As I put there, the average reading age in the UK is 13. So you do have to think about that. And, and to be honest, I'm, um, I prefer photographs, pictures, uh, shorter text. Uh, we, we, we do tend to uh, rush through things in life anyway, don't we? But people generally will want to have, have easier guidebooks that, to read with photos. Check, is it up to date? Is it inspiring and engaging? And what is missing? What could you do uh, as well alongside what you already have? This quote from Simon Thurley, if people understand their building, they will value it. By valuing it, they will want to look after it. In caring for it, they will help others enjoy it. From enjoyment of the historic environment comes a greater thirst to understand it and the circle begins again. So that is so important. So as I say, we've been talking about tourism, but as we open up to tourists and, and welcome people in, the community will be impacted greatly as well as, as we're offering uh, more engaging, inspirational uh, information about the church, our communities will be interested, they will come in, they will learn about our church, and they will also then begin to value it more, and they will want to look after it. And that is so important as we're thinking about funding. We really want our community on board, don't we, to support uh, our church that is there for generations to come. So getting to the end, don't worry, things to do now. Uh, have a look at your online presence. Are you on Explore Churches? Um, visit your website like a stranger and also, but I'm very happy to, to look at your website for you as well, or whatever it is that you've, you've already on. Some churches don't even have a website and are using a church near you. And that's, that's fine. That's absolutely no problem at all. But just make sure that your details are there, including your postcode so that people can get to you. Everybody uses SatNav these days, your opening times as well, um, if you've got an opening time. Um, or if it changes from winter to summer, make sure somebody's updating that so people know. You can claim your Google map entry so that actually when people go on Google, it will come up on their Google search. So. Um, do check that out uh, and your social media as well we're all 
most of us now are on on Facebook and it's a great way again of using your Facebook page to tell some of your stories you know put some photos on I love this this display from St Mabin and um, you know it, they've got photographs and things like that well you could put a photo a week or a day or whatever probably a week on your Facebook page uh, of memories of of the community and how much then more people will engage in um, in the church and what's going on online content <clears throat> could you create a virtual tour well now one church down in St Justin Penwith have done that and they've now got a virtual tour 360 type tour around their church and um, they are um, they, they paid for someone to do that but it's actually quite simple you can actually use your phone video to, to put some videos onto your your website to uh, to show people what the church is like um, as I say photos and stories so important I'll leave you some with, with some resources to take away so these will be sent out the slides so you'll be able to, to catch up with these again um, one of the things that we've got in the diocese is this pack called a way to welcome which has got lots of um, ideas of how to how to welcome from what goes on outside to um, inside so and although this isn't in print at the moment all the information uh, all the pages are on the websites as well okay that's my details if you do want to uh, uh, catch up with me again uh, please feel free to send any questions that's great thank you so much for that Liz that was such a rich and valuable presentation uh, with a lot of information um, so I think people are really going to value having that sent uh, at the end uh, I think we'll save Q&A uh, for the end uh, so if people can keep those questions uh, to, to the end we'll have a little bit of time for that and we'll jump straight to uh, Jane Jane Yeomans who is going to be telling us a little bit uh, more about funders um, and how the questions of uh, funding might relate to some of the things that Liz has been talking about. Jane. Great, thank you, Daniel. Uh, let me just uh, pull up my um, screen to share. Okay, uh, perfect. So um, let me see my... Okay, uh, so uh, my name is Jane Yeomans. I'm the project manager for Transformation Cornwall, and we uh, deliver Meet the Funders in partnership with, uh, uh, with the diocese. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be looking at developing your, your community engagement and finding funding. So if we think about how we welcome tourists, we also think about how we welcome our community. And Liz has given us great tips on the how and why of welcome. But I'm also specifically going to look in this presentation about how successful, and by which I mean meaningful, community engagement is at the root of your project. How to develop your community engagement into successful project funding and where that funding might be found. So I've put here the image of a seed and starting with the image of a seed in your hand, which is where we find so many of our Meet the Funders attendees. Um, if we think of a seed as symbolizing a beginning, we have a mix of attendees who are either sowing the seeds of a completely new project or sowing the seeds in a, of a related project that develops from something already existing, or sowing the seeds and about to begin a next phase of a project that has existed for a long, long time. So we all know that a plant seed needs lots of things to help it grow. It needs enough light, enough water, good soil, the right temperature, temp tender care, but for our project seeds, they need a lot of things too. They need leading and nurturing by knowledgeable and passionate people and teams, but they also need shaping, reflecting, tweaking, 
trialing, they definitely need starting, they need learning and they need sharing, both within your project team and your community in its widest sense. They need sharing with your current and national beneficial, uh, potential beneficiaries, your supporters, your neighbours, your visitors, your partner community groups. So what I'd like to do is to encourage you to share that seed that's in your hand with the big wide world. And by that, I mean your community. So let your community shape your project. And I've put here the image of, a project, of your project as a heart in the middle. And going from the left all the way around your project, I've put what ideas does your community have for what they want and need? Going north, what are the key issues they want to address? Moving east, what other groups and organisations are working to meet these needs? What services are already provided? And going south, what are the gaps in services? What, are the, what needs are not being met by any group or organisation? Very often, that project seed that you knew so well in your hand, it goes on to flourish and grow into this incredible, maybe even unexpected plant. But certainly at the time of sowing that seed, it's hard to visualise what it becomes. And your community can really shape that. So community engagement in funding bids. I've taken here direct quotes from grant applications from some funders. So for example, the National Lottery Community Fund will directly ask you, how does your project involve your community? All Churches Trust will have, um, Please describe your project in detail and how your research or consultation has informed your plans. Bernard Sunley Foundation will ask, how will the project benefit and how? Please tell us about any existing or new partnerships with other organisations. Alan Lane Foundation, why is your project important to your community? explain wh why your community is interested in the project and why they care about it. National Lottery Heritage Fund will ask, please tell us why you are planning to do this work and how you know there is a need for it. Now, I could have gone on with lots more uh, quotes of questions in funding bids, but they will always have in common that they want, A, that they will want to know that you've consulted and B, they will want to know how that consultation shaped your plans. Now, I'm going to look at an example of a community consultation or listening that one church carried out. And here I've taken the example of All Saints Church in Hyattown for its 1010 project, Ultra Low Lifehouse. It's a huge redevelopment of an existing church's community building. So their consultation started in a special Sunday morning launch with the church community. We asked the church community what they really wanted from their community hub. They surveyed a neighboring brand new housing estate called Pen Andre, again to ask them what they thought. So that was one-to-one -one doorstep surveys. They asked every group's group using All Saints what would really help them. So this was uh, a talking and listening exercise individually with each of the projects. They also held a special summer community event and brought to attract the local community. And they asked them what they really wanted from their community hub. They asked them what they wanted on their inside spaces, what they wanted on their outside spaces how they'd like to, the church to be used, and any other ideas. Now, for many people, a community or consultation 
will be a bit of a scare. But at its core, it's just talking and listening together. And often that goes well around a cup of tea or an event or a special day. And I'd like to give you a hint on how to create something. We're actually going to think about getting some funding to help with that. So I'm going to look at Heritage Lottery Fund for engagement. So historically, Heritage Lottery Fund might be thought of as an obvious funder for older listed church building repairs. But Heritage Lottery Funds, or HLF, their mandatory requirement, what they will want from each application, is that a wider range of people will be involved in heritage. HLF do not fund projects that are solely for repairs or alterations for historic fabric. And often HLF might get an application from a church or a project for a substantial cost to its building repairs or reordering. For example, it might get an application in for, I don't know, uh, £160,000 for roof repairs and entranceway redesign. But have a think about the places of worship that HLF support help local and wider communities to engage with heritage. HLF will fund activities that connect people with heritage, that's one. Or secondly, they will fund activities that connect people with heritage and include some capital works to historic fabric. So consider using an HLF small grant, so it's marked here in this box in pink, to fund an initial community event where you focus on engagement. You can yet then use this event as a springboard to later funding from HLF with a big cost, for example, that roof and redesign project. But you can show that you can engage your community and that your community are interested. So your initial engagement event can allow meaningful community engagement. It can highlight the background or the context or the heritage of your project. And it can, you can use that learning to be a springboard to develop any later funding bits, gathering evidence to answer those typical questions that I put on the earlier slide. Now, when you are ready to look for funders, we've a number of resources that we can help you to find out about project funders. And I've got three examples here. So we've got our resource document from the Meet Funders Spring event that happened in May this year. Uh, we've got our fortnightly updated grants for groups list. Um, that, well, it was last updated last Friday, the 2nd of July. So we're next to you on the 16th of July and that's ongoing. It's downloadable from our website. Or we have the funders presentations from the spring event. So we've got presentations from Joseph Rank, National Churches Trust, Cornwall Historic Churches Trust, National Lottery and others. Um, you can see all their logos there. And that's also on our website. And each of these things have a whole load of detail that will help you learn more about what each funder likes to fund. And we've also got an October workshop where we'll have a funder present, although that's not confirmed who that is, we will be having a funder along. And we'll also be talking attendees through some key questions in a funding application. But also, if you need to chat through or you've got thoughts that you want to run by someone, just do get in touch. But also I would recommend that we use uh, Q&A today um, to kind of take, th take people through any of those kind of initial questions. Now I'm gonna pass back to Daniel as we're going to listen to our experts. Thank you. That's great, thank you so much for that, Jane. Um, yes, as Jane said now, we're going to have a little section now called Experts Through Experience, which is where we get to hear uh, a little bit of advice and wisdom uh, from those that have done things like this or have particular knowledge uh, relating to things like funding and tourism. And our two experts today are Andrew Hicks and Kay Short. So, Andrew, I thought I might um, 
Oh, Andrew's just getting a cup of tea, just in time. Andrew, I thought I might start with you. Um, Andrew's joining us from uh, St Uni Church in uh, Leyland. Uh, and a fun fact uh, about St Uni Church is that it is the only official British starting place of the Caminata de Santiago de Compostela. Um, I can see Andrew's nodding there, I've got that right. <laughs> Um, so Andrew, I guess uh, my first question for you is, could you tell us uh, a little bit more about the church uh, and the ways in which the church has historically used uh, tourism uh, as a way of uh, bringing funding opportunities into the church? Oh, I think you're on mute, Andrew. Yeah, it's a very beautiful, very ancient church and a stunning site um, uh, on the Hale Estuary uh, with a view over the St Ives Bay. Um, it's on the southwest coastal path, so we get a lot of walkers. It's on the longest local beach with, um, you have to walk across the golf course to get there, but um, it's dog friendly all year round. So we get a lot of dog walkers going past the church. Southwest footpath actually runs through between the, uh, we have three different graveyards of various stages of, of ancientness. The footpath mm -hmm. runs right through the middle, right by the church. Uh, and the uh, it's on two, it's not only on the Camino, but it's also on the Saints, Pilgrim route, which comes down through Cornwall, and it's uh, the start of St Michael's Way, which runs from us to St Michael's Mount. Uh, and those, certainly two of those very ancient pilgrim routes. Um, we also are uh, the birthplace and the baptism and wedding place for Rosamond Pilcher, who is a an authoress, uh, she wrote The Shell Seekers, which is probably her best known book, um, but she is loved in Germany. They have hundreds, well, a, a hundred or more apparently films and programs and so on that go on. So we get a lot of visitors from Germany to the extent we have a, a German Bible in church and all our leaflets are in German as well as mm. in English. Um, that's the background we also we were talking about refurbishment we have a lot to do um need to replace the floor and that gave us an opportunity to think about how can we make the church more um community useful because mm. the village has a pub a, a village hall that we work very closely with um and it has no shops no post office no bank nothing like that and church therefore has a huge opportunity to serve the community. And the one other asset we have is a little mortuary chapel that was, which can, we can use as a, a cafe, we can use as a sort of little history museum sort of information area. And we have lots inside the church that we, we can, we need to label more. We're on a pathway, really. Mm. Um, there's so many good ideas, so many good ideas that have come up today, um, mm. like um, creating a video, putting photos of the various bits and pieces in your church on Explore Churches. There's a lot of room on Explore Churches um, to put information and mm. encourage people to come and look. Mm. Um, so, so it's really important, I think, to know your footfall is important. I know Kay will be talking a bit more about that, I suspect. But knowing your footfall and the traditional ways to count your numbers in your uh, visitor's book and multiply, uh, variously people argue by five or eight or 10. But mm. actually, I think for us, that gives us five, five, five and a half thousand visitors a year. Um, wow. You can get counters and some churches that thought they had 5,000 visitors have found they have 50,000 visitors. Wow. When you're applying for grants, the number of visitors you have is hugely important. Mm. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because one of the things that really strikes me there from chatting is that, you know, it seems like you have a really good knowledge of the people that are visiting your church. 
um, which then means that you can tailor your approach specifically to those that are coming. So as you said, you have a lot of uh, German tourists that come visit, so you have promotional material uh, available in German. Uh, I guess as we're coming out of the pandemic, um, and for a lot of churches that has meant um, shutting the doors, are, are St Uni looking at new and creative ways perhaps of uh, fundraising through tourism? Yeah, I'm not as connected with St Uni itself as I used to, but certainly we were looking at, because we've had to close the cafe, the, the, the little sort of, it's called a heritage centre, um, that's in the churchyard, we've had to close that through the COVID time, so we're looking to reopen that. If you can provide refreshments or something in the church, I know for instance St Ia Church in St Ives do cream teas through the summer, that bring people into the church, they make some income, but also if people look around the church, we can gently encourage them to donate as well. Um, mm. so, so that's one thing we were looking at, um, trying to get disabled access, like a lot of churches, you have to go down stone steps. It's, you know, you can get community grants for improving disabled access. Mm. Um, doing things if you can't have cream teas and your church is unattended, and it is now possible to open your churches when they're unattended, unless you have hugely valuable things that can be stolen. Um, you, you can then have, I don't know, drinks available with disposable cups, so that you're, it just makes it a bit more welcoming. Um, so just a bottle of orange squash and a tap um, and a bin and the appropriate encouragement to sanitize and so on, uh, just makes the church more friendly. And particularly you can, you can signpost it up, um, but, but making access I think is very important. And you, as I say, don't just think of going for the church grants for that, look at community grants. Um, if you want to run a cafe, look at community grants for making it available to uh, I don't know, dementia cafes, um, mm. there are all sorts of things. Look at your inside of your building to see if you can create a bit more space for people to move around to put a presentation um, of pictures in, of a bit of the history. Improve your leaflets, we talked about that. There are so many things that we were sort of starting to look at and starting to develop, mm. but it's a pathway, it's a process and you'll never get it finished. The mm. Lord, new ideas coming along. Yeah, getting Wi-Fi in if, is helpful if you can, because that mm. again allows you to do a lot more for the community. If you can't get Wi-Fi, there's some very good 4G stuff mm. that you can get, which will serve up to 10, 15, 20 computers, so you can run computer clubs. The more people you get into the church, the more donations you get. Basically, is the yeah the bottom yeah. line that enables the church to thrive. And people, anybody coming into a church, you, you are, by definition, witnessing to the spirituality of that place and, mm. and bringing people nearer to, to faith. And that has to be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredibly helpful. Um, and I think, you know, what you said there about getting people into the church, the more people you bring in, I guess part of that relies on uh, churches being open. And I guess this is where, um, Kay, I might ask you to join our mm. conversation. Um, I guess a lot of churches, you know, because of coronavirus um, and the the risk the people that's perceived, um, they've been a little bit scared and apprehensive about opening their church or what sorts of risk assessments they might need to do. Uh, I wonder if you might be able to, I guess, give us a little bit of insight into what sort of risk assessments a church might have to do if they do want to open their church to the public. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first thing I would like to say, um, though, is, is that we really do, as an insurer, we really do encourage um, churches to keep their, their doors open. Um, it, not only is it an opportunity for mission and for, for funding um, and, and raising income, um, but it also actually has a positive effect on security if, if churches are open. Um, because legitimate visitors um, into, into churches will deter those that, that aren't there for legitimate purposes. So it, it is something that we really, really do like to encourage. Um, and there is no requirement to have somebody on the premises all the time when a building is open. Um, that, that's one of the biggest myths that, uh, that, that we come across. 
Um, now, there are lots of reasons why you might want to have people in, in church and in terms of welcome um, and, and so on. That's, that's a really good, good reason, um, but it, it's not an absolute requirement. So when you're thinking about the things that, um, um, in terms of risk assessment, um, things that you need to think about, um, you, you want to focus on security, um, um, but it's about a proportionate amount of security. Um, it's not about bolting and screwing everything, everything down. It is about um, making it accessible, um, but not leaving the best silver out um, um, so that it is, is easily uh, stealable. Um, but the biggest thing to think about, though, is the safety of people who are coming into, into church um, and bearing in mind that these might not be people who are familiar with the church building if they're visitors. Um, and so the things that, that, that ordinarily we do in our churches week in, week out, like stepping over that trailing wire um, because we know it's there um, or, 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 or knowing where there is a change in the floor level, um, uh, you need to think about it from, from the perspective of somebody that does not know the church building and what might be a hazard um, a, a hazard to them. Um, um, and uh, so, so there's your health and safety side of it, there's your security side of it, and then there's the fire risk assessment side, which is the one risk assessment that every church building must have. Um, and if you've got visitors coming in, then you just need to think about the um, what how would they know what they need to do if there was a, what was a fire? So, so those are the three areas. But, it, but none of this is complicated. Um, it, it is actually very straightforward. Most of it is about common sense, um, um, although <laughs> whether, whether that's quite as common as we, as we think of this is another matter. Um, but, it, but it is. It's, it, it's, a, it's about having a proportionate and balanced response to things. Um, it, it's not reams and reams and reams of paperwork. Um, it, it, it's, it's just a thinking through what might cause um, harm to somebody um, and the different types of people that are coming in and, and is there anything more that you actually need to do. Now heritage buildings, most of our heritage buildings are not perfectly um, uh, level or, or you know um, that, that they are heritage buildings that there are all sorts of bits and pieces that, that, that are different in them um, and you don't have to make them perfect. It, um, heritage buildings do have um, intrinsic hazards um, and that's absolutely fine but, but you do need to just it's about that sensible thing so um, Andrew mentioned um, a, a about some um, step, steps in, uh, in, in churches um, going up is, is a problem but coming down is also a problem um, especially if those steps are immediately on the inside of your door um, mm -hmm. uh, it's a good idea to have um, a, a little notice to say there are steps immediately behind this door please take care so that people don't just walk in and fall down them. Um, mm. it, it, it's really simple things that can be done to, just to make it that little bit safer, but none of it has to be complicated. None of it has to be expensive. Um, and, and we do actually provide lots of um, templates um, that people can use um, to do those assessments um, mm. to make it as simple as we possibly can. Yeah, that's really helpful, uh, especially to hear it coming uh, coming from UK, obviously, with your ecclesiastical insurance hat on. Um, I guess as a as a final question, some people might hear these things and think, ah, that sounds like a lot of paperwork. Um, is that the case? It's particularly in the context of, you know, now and wanting to have our churches open now. Yeah, um, now yeah, th th with COVID, this COVID side of it, you do need to think about those additional things such as cleaning surfaces and, and, and whatever in line with the, with the guidance. Um, um, and so, you, so your COVID risk assessment is probably the one that needs to be the most detailed, um, the most detailed one. Um, but but the, the, the other um, assessments, um, a lot of them are dynamic, so, um, um, and you, you just need to jot them down. Um, they don't need to be on lots, of, lots and lots of forms or anything. It, it is really, really simple. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Kay, uh, and thank you so much, Andrew. Your insights are, are really, really helpful, um, and no doubt, I'm, I think people will be really reassured to, uh, to hear it coming from you as our experts. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Liz uh, for a little bit of a time of Q&A uh, before we finish up today's session. Liz. Great, thank you. Yes, and firstly, thank you to, to Andrew and Kay to start with. Also a reminder that on Wednesday at 12 o'clock, uh, we'll have a full uh, webinar hour of, uh, of hearing from Kay about the insurer's perspective on open churches. So lots more information uh, 
there. So please do look at that. I've got that right, haven't I, Kay? I think it's 10 o'clock, actually. Is it 10 o'clock? It's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Yeah. Anyway, some, yeah, thank you. Yes, it is. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's have a look. Now, we've got a great question here from Shelley. Thanks, Shelley. How can we persuade our community that it would be a good idea to put a kitchen in our church when we have an institute and a village hall within a quarter of quarter mile of the church and public loos across the road? We do cream teas in the summer holiday weekends, soup and sweet, soup and sweet every month usually and various fundraising events throughout the year. So a kitchen would be very useful. We don't have water inside yet so i think i'll i'll direct that at jane great and and thank you shelly i saw that question come up um so i guess firstly you can't persuade your community um if you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink i think that is the saying you can certainly ask your community now in my experience uh, I absolutely recognise that you've got an institute and a village hall within a quarter of a mile. These aren't your competitors. They are additional village uh, facilities. So what I would say there, so and, and that you don't currently have water inside yet. So not having water inside yet, you know, absolutely, that's uh, your... Uh, a very old church and as Kay says you know that, that's often got additional obstacles there so what a fun so there are specific funders for kitchens and they will be expecting larger applications for that kind of uh, uh, developing onto the kind of mainline water so they'll just be expecting for a, a bigger ask in there now in terms of, of persuading your community. So uh, first of all, I would like to think about who actually is in your community. If you've got a local school or your and, and your also your congregation. Um, now, you know, for those visits uh, and for staying open, people are going to need to, to come into the church. They're probably going to need to go use the bathroom while they're there. Um, and also that kind of opportunity to have a kitchen just absolutely diversifies uh, the building, having a, a cup of tea or, or for the um, cream, you know, for the, for the uh, church community to be able to wash up on site and not kind of lug it all home or into another venue is really, really important. So we can help direct you to specific funders that will look at putting in church kitchens I'd absolutely say go for it, but I'd say that you're not going to persuade your community, but start by asking them, because I think that your community will already be saying, oh, I wish we had a toilet in the church, or I wish we had a, a, a kitchen, and I'm sure your uh, church helpers who are doing those uh, cream teas or the, the soup and sweet lunch, they're certainly thinking, well, it would be great if we had water on premises. And we had a little kitchen here. Yeah, I think um, as well, because I know one of the group, don't they, uh, when they're having weddings, uh, to be able to offer people that arrive early from a long way away, um, you know, to, to, to have a cup of tea before the, before the service starts or a drink, a you know, cold drink or something like that. Right, actually, sorry. So Shelley's saying, sorry, they're not saying that. They're saying that we should, we should use other places uh, okay, so so uh, so, but places to worship in, and you know, in that kind of example that Liz has said around kind of, uh, you know, uh, getting married, um, you know, that that won't be happening in, uh, you know, the village hall or in the institute. This is going to enable your church to actually divert, not just diversify its offering, but be able to offer a more. Um, comprehensive offering mm. yeah I hope that makes sense Andrew did you want to yeah I was going to to add to that our heritage center at the moment does not have drainage or uh, running water so we carry water over from the church but it is possible to get a health certificate 
to run cafes in that place. You just have to check the regulations, preferably get somebody who's, who actually knows about it. And, and there are people, there will be people in the community, maybe friends who work in restaurants or whatever, who can advise you. It is possible. I think also in terms of inside loos, at the moment we have an outside loo in the Sexton's Hut on the southwest coastal path. There is no toilet available to the public between Hale and Carvis Bay. Um, and if we get, as part of our project, inside toilets, we don't actually want everybody on the beach to be trailing sand into the church to use our inside toilets, but we could convert our outside toilet, have a coin or card machine on the door, raise money for the upkeep of the church and provide a community service. And that's the sort of thing, because you're creating something for the community, you could, you could include either in one of your big grant applications or even look for a specific grant from town council, will probably bite your hand off and give you some money, for instance. So it, it, a lot of it is about sort of think outside the box a little. What can you do? And actually, what can you do can actually have side effects. Um, that will actually give further benefit. So, you know, have lots of talks, have lots of discussion, pick the brains. You, Everybody, I mean, our churches, we moaned at their old, older um, congregations, but actually those older congregations have got a lot of experience, a lot of wisdom. Use it. Great, thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Right. If anybody has anything else to add, I think we'll... Well, it's 12 o'clock, so um, thank you. Thanks, Andrew, for the other. You wrote on the chat as well. Um, last, yeah, if you're applying for grants, save all your paragraphs you generate for, for forms um, on your desktop and cut and paste. Yep, yeah, that's a very good tip. Thank you. That final tip there. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrew and Kay, for being our experts through experience today and joining us today. Really helpful. Um, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Daniel, as well. And just to say, our next uh, webinar, which uh, never know, might be in person, but we haven't decided. We'll see how it goes. Is Monday, the twentieth of September. Living today with tomorrow in mind, exploring how we can ensure our projects are ecological and sustainable, and where to find funding for environmental projects. That's going to be really interesting, very useful, because environment is so key to so many funders these days as well. So uh, details about that will be uh, coming out in due course once we know a little bit more about what's happening with, with um, meeting in person or being online. So thank you very much. Thanks everybody for joining us and hope that was helpful. This will be available to watch back, but uh, again, details in due course. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Hi everyone. Thank you.